Okay, so we have a pleasure to see Professor Ortega in our institute again. He has visited uh, us several times. The last time it was uh, three years ago. And also he um, gave uh, lectures at our summer school uh, last year. So we are in close uh, contact with uh, Professor Ortega and uh, for those who are not acquainted with him, uh, Professor Ortega uh, was born in Mexico. Uh, then uh, he spent some time in St. Petersburg, but uh, and now he works uh, in France. Uh, at Supelec, and uh, well, he travels all over the world. Mm, he has more than 300 papers published. Yes, uh, as Romero said to me, uh, each uh, year he publishes uh, some 15 or something like these papers in refereed journals. Uh, it's uh, an example for uh, young guys here uh, to have such activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, moreover, we are uh, pleased that uh, uh, Romeo uh, found some time. He is very seasonal, he is a fan of Mexican team and <laughs> football championship. <laughs> He visits all these uh, games, and <laughs> nevertheless, he found some time uh, to give this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, I don't have any friends in Ekaterinburg and, and in Kazan for Mexico is playing next time. So uh, I only have the choice of and the fortune of meeting Professor Poliak. And indeed, it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here again. And uh, Moscow is a lovely city. I, I travel a lot to Petersburg and Leningrad in my time. And, uh, but I, it's always very nice to come to, to Moscow and, and enjoy the green of Moscow. I should apologize because uh, I know that this talk is, I'm very bad in giving uh, overall motivating talks. And I, I, I know that some people expect uh, people to not to talk about very specific uh, problem-oriented uh, talks, but more overview talks, and I'm really very bad at that. So th this talk is is uh, about some specific results on some specific problem, and I know that not everyone in this room is interested in in mechanical systems. Not everyone is interested in in the kind of techniques or problems that we address here. So I apologize for that. Uh, but in any case, it's recent results, so 2016, 2017, and they are uh, joint collaboration with former students from both from Mexico and Argentina. So these are the contents. These are three of the papers that uh, that uh, Boris mentioned <laughs> that just appeared or are going to, be, to appear. Actually, uh, nonlinear control of mechanical systems is, is a very old topic. We have been working on it for 30, 40 years probably. And it's a very well-known field since Lagrange and, and uh, Luria himself work on that. So uh, it's an old topic, but now we're focusing on some specific issues that are technologically motivated in, in robotics, in particular by drones, by, by walking robots, but mobile robots. So what are, what, are, what are the theoretical challenges that these new robotic systems pose? And uh, we have done a lot of work, as I said before, not just ourselves, many groups. And I, I'm going to talk briefly about the previous results. And these are, as I said, recent results. So what, what else can we do than what has already been done? What, what was done is the, the usual problem of stabilization, of a problem with full state measurements and without noise and without parameter uncertainty. So that's the starting point for all control problems. So let's assume that I know everything about the system, I know all the equations, I know all the parameters, and pose a, a stabilization to a point 
problem. So the next step is robustness. So the next step is robustness in many respects, in particular to external disturbances. So in mechanical systems, it's unavoidable to have some drifting signals or some noise in the measurements of velocity and so on. So can you modify the existing laws that ensure stability of an ideal system without noise and make it robust with respect to the presence of noise. As you can imagine, the solution is adding an integrator. So we're basically adding an integrator, but a clever integrator. I will show you that if you add an, an integrator, brute force integrator, it's not just not going to work, but it's also going to create havoc. It's going to create a manifold of equilibrium and a very complicated dynamics. So the, 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 really the challenge is where to add the integrator, how to add it in order to reject, of course, constant disturbances. If we want to reject sinusoids or things like that, you need something more complicated. That's still an open problem. The second uh, problem that we studied are uh, with respect to absence of measurements of velocities. So let's assume that you only, for those of you who are, have experience in mechanical systems, measuring velocity is complicated, so you want to reconstruct velocity by measurement of position and electrical signals. And then adding uh, the particular aspect that you want it to be adaptive. And adaptive in, this, in a very specific sense, in the sense that you don't know friction. So friction is a phenomenon that is difficult to model. We're going to model it by linear Coulomb-like friction, but the parameters are unknown. Okay? So it's, it's a problem of adaptive speed observers, so reconstructing velocity in mechanical systems without knowledge of some of the elements in the friction. Unfortunately, we cannot solve them all, but some of them. Okay? And finally, uh, this is a topic I talked about in, in, uh, in the school of, of um, uh, this institute last year. We are very excited about PID. We, the last, let's say, 10 years of my activity has been concentrated on PID because I realized that it works. It works and, and that's what people want. So if you want to sell your ideas to application-oriented groups, companies or even your neighbor next door working on chemical processes or, or process control or whatever, he would buy PIDs without any problem. That's for sure. I, I, there's a, a nice metaphor about PIDs that I recently thought about. So PIDs is like uh, you, you act based on your info current information, so on the present, the proportional part, on based on the past information, which is the integral part, and based on the future information, which is the derivative part. So PID cannot be any cleverer than that. So you act based on information from the past, the present, and the future. So that's, I think it's a nice explanation why PIDs are so ubiquitous and so successful. I recently was reading statistics from this instrument, Instrumentation Society of America. 93% of all control loops in the world are PIDs. 93%. So that's, I'm not talking about high tech like space or, or nuclear, but industry, industry. So reactors and, and, and uh, motors and so on, they, they are controlled by PIDs. So that's, that's a, an unquestionable dominance of a particular architecture of control. So I'm going to talk about PIDs of uh, passivity based control. The, the writing of the dynamics, this is the dynamics of a, a general mechanical system. You can write it also in, in, in Lagrangian form, if you're more familiar with Lagrangian form. So something like this. It's, it's equivalent. Mm. Sorry. So this is the Euler-Lagrange description of a mechanical system where Q are the generalized positions, Q dot the generalized velocities, accelerations, the M is the inertia matrix, this is what is called the Coriolis and centrifugal forces, and this is the potential energy, so this is the force induced by the potential energy, and then you have some matrix that may depend on, on the coordinates that defines which one of the degrees of freedom has actuators. So motors or some way of acting on the mechanical coordinates. 
We prefer to write it in this form, uh, which is called the Port Hamiltonian model, but it's the same. Okay, it's the same. We, you can go from one to the other via the Lagrange transform. Le sorry, Legendre transform. Uh, here, p, p is the momenta, which is m times q dot, and q is the same as q over there. I have. We start from the following uh, situation. We assume that you already had a control for this system. The, this is, let's say, the open loop system, and you design a controller that shaped the energy function, so made this VQ have a minimum at the point you want to stabilize. Remember, we're talking about stabilization of an equilibrium point, a constant equilibrium point. So you, we assume that you already solved this problem. So there's a controller that will do its job without disturbances, okay? And will do its job in the sense that this is a Lyapunov function for this system without disturbances and without you. Uh, and uh, the equilibrium point is globally asymptotically stable. You can prove that this is a, a bona fide Lyapunov function and you can prove that. So you solve already the ideal problem without noise. And the question is, let's assume that I have some external noise, some disturbances. Normally, the people talk about disturbances here because these are disturbances on the velocity. But if you talk about the closed loop system, there appear also disturbances here because of the action of the controller. So the controller, when you close the loop on, on a loop loop system like this, if there is noise in the controller measurements, it will pop up as a, a disturbance in here. So you have disturbances. It's what people call underactuated. Sorry, I made a mistake here. And we're talking about fully actuated, fully actuated. Uh, mechanical systems, okay? Not, not under-actuated, but fully actuated. So the number of degrees of freedom is equal to the number of control actions. <coughs> and th there's a classification of these disturbances. People call these disturbances matched disturbances because they enter into the image of the input matrix. Sorry. And unmatched disturbances. So as expected, the rejecting these disturbances is harder than rejecting this, but it's still possible. Okay? Now we consider two scenarios, one which is uh, constant, so just reject constant disturbances, and we would like to preserve stability of the desired equilibrium. So the desired equilibrium is Q equal to Q star and P equal to zero, so you are in a fixed point, desired point, in spite of the presence of the disturbances. So you want to reject the disturbances. Now, if they are time-bearing, so they are slowly time-bearing but bounded, then you would like to have a property which is called input state stability. So you would like to prove that even though you have these time-bearing disturbances here, the map from disturbances to the state is L infinity state. Okay, so that's, that's input state stability. Now the main, the main technical tools, there was a paper introduced by, by my collaborator Donaire in his uh, master's thesis, which was published in 10, that was a breakthrough. It was the first time that for general nonlinear systems, not just mechanical, for general nonlinear systems, they came out with an idea of how to add the integrator, the nonlinear integrator. Later on, uh, we extended this result and applied it in particular to mechanical systems, okay? And the, it consists basically of two things. It's a clever change of coordinates, so you need to, to change the coordinates preserving, uh, this is uh, the so-called port Hamiltonian structure. You want to preserve this structure because later on this structure is going to be used to construct your Lyapunov function. So the interest of this structure is that if you remove these terms here, this h is a Lyapunov function. So h dot is more than equal to zero. And actually because of the presence of this positive definite matrix, it may be a strict Lyapunov function, okay? And then the addition that I'm not sure this is going to work, and sometimes it works. I would like to show you a movie uh, as motivation. So this is uh, the, the so-called Acrobot. So the Acrobot is a, a two degree of freedom uh, system where you have actuation only here, okay? No actuation here. So the first motion, let, let me repeat it, is um, 
without or this move is wrong. Without without this control, this is joint work actually with Bruno Siciliano from Naples. So you close the loop with the controller that does the the job of stabilizing. Look that we're managing to lift the acrobat without switching. It's a smooth controller that lifts the pendulum. As far as we know, it's the only one existing in the literature that you can prove that this point is a almost global asymptotically stable point. And then comes the disturbance. So some step, and because you don't compensate for the disturbance, it now it, the equilibrium point becomes this point. Okay? So now you want to add an additional loop which is an integral action here with the PID controller and at this time you add the disturbance so the, the beginning is the same beginning is the same as before so it lifts, stabilizes the equilibrium and then comes the disturbance and you will see that it recovers and rejects the disturbance so at 25 comes the disturbance and it's really almost negligible because of the action of the control it, it moves a little bit and then comes back. So with a integral action we manage to reject the disturbance. So it, without this integral the, the acrobat will stop in some position here. This is another example, these are experiments done in Naples. It's a system called disk on disk. So you have one disk which is actuated and the other one which is non-actuated and it's rotating and you want to place this arrow in this position so alienate the two disks. This is a problem that is motivated by helicopter control and CD and readers as far as I understand. So first, uh, you saw before that it shifted, now we add a PID controller and it should come back. So it, it, the disturbance, the, you see the disturbance moved it here, but then the interval action brings it back. Okay. So it's, uh, it's doing its job. Okay, so I just want to show you this before getting into the technical details. Okay, so let me talk about something that not too many people know. I mean, there are papers, papers in the literature that claim that this is a solution to the problem, and it is not. So the, the, first, the obvious thing to do if you want to design a PID, another PID there, or simply an integral action, is to measure velocity and feed it back. So this is, this is velocity feedback. So you take velocity, uh, you integrate velocity, and feed it back, multiplied by some gain Ki. And there are papers of people proposing this. Well, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. You can show that if you do this, you create a manifold of equilibria. You can, the, the, the zero point, or the minimum point of B is not the unique minimum. There, there's a whole manifold of equilibria, and without disturbances, with or without disturbances, this foliation of the manifold, you see it's a, a linear uh, a manifold, is invariant. So the picture is the following, so the conclusion is that the convergence to the desired equilibrium point is attained only for a zero measure set of initial conditions. So whatever you start, almost, whatever, almost all, all the space where you start, you will not converge to the right equilibrium. So the picture is the following, you are creating, this is the state space, generalized positions, generalized momenta, and your state of the integrator. So you create these subspaces, which are invariant spaces. So if you start in there, you remain in there. So your equilibrium point is not necessarily in one of these uh, manifolds. It, it will be uh, a zero measurable event. Okay? So this thing, which is unknown, uh, I mean, we reported it, and we got mails from people, people insulting us, saying, uh, how can you say that? Well, we prove it mathematically, it's proven. Okay? So papers which are simply wrong. Okay? So what you need to do is something m more complicated than just take velocity, integrate it, and feed it back. So of course, the, the solutions get more and more complicated as you take a more and more general case. So the simplest case is when M is constant. So the inertia matrix is constant, and when you have constant disturbances. 
Okay, so that's the basic solution. The system is still nonlinear because of the potential energy, but this term disappears because of constant m. Remember that these Coriolis and centrifugal forces are generated by the Christoffel symbols of the second kind of the inertia matrix m, so they are related one to one. So in that case, we can prove the following. Now you, you take again a PI. But what you integrate, this is the state of the controller, is not uh, velocity, but you integrate the gravity forces. So these forces which are perturbing the dynamics, this is what you need to put in your integrator. So integrate that and then pass it to a, to a PI. So a proportional part, and in, sorry, an integral part, uh, sorry, this should be KI, KP, sorry. And, and, there, and there you have to be careful because you have to multiply by M. So Ki and Kp are positive definite matrices, but you need this uh, matrix to stand in there in order for the proof to hold. So this matrix is not necessarily positive definite anymore, even though each one of them is positive definite. Okay? So the gain, not, not just you have to choose the output cleverly, but you also have to choose your gains cleverly. So the Pi gains cannot be an arbitrary positive definite matrix, which is usually the case with Pi's. Okay. Now you can show the following. Remember we said that one of our objectives was to preserve the Hamiltonian structure. You can show that if you do this change of coordinates from Q, P, Z3, to Z1, Z2, Z3, you get this kind of closed loop dynamics. And this is still a poor Hamiltonian system. But now, with the energy function, which has a minimum where you want, this Z3 star is the, the, the value that your integrator has to have in order to reject the disturbances. And you can show that this equilibrium is, is globally asymptotically stable. I should say almost globally because these systems live on, on manifolds which are not uh, diffeomorphic to, to Rn, okay? but almost globally. Okay. By the way, you can stop me anytime if you have any questions or, or, or is there something not clear, I, I would be glad to to elaborate a little bit more. Okay. Uh, so what are our assumptions uh, about M, V? M is constant. And positive definite? Yes, and positive definite. So there, there's what no C. V? v is, is a function that has a minimum at the desired value, any function. Uh, we don't assume it to be a simple minimum. Uh, I single minimum, yeah. Isolated minimum, yeah. But maybe non-convex. Maybe non-convex. Maybe non-convex. Yeah. If it's convex, the proof is simple. Yeah. And if it's strictly convex, it's simple. Actually, if for that case, we can remove the m. But if it's just a minimum, uh, you you need the m for the proof. Okay. And you see what you there, I, I'm, I think it's right, it's the Ki's and the Kp's appear here, but they appear in a, in a skew-symmetric way. So minus Ki, Ki, I minus I. So this is what is called a symplectic uh, ge geometry. Okay. Sorry, let me ask you, why do you take Pi control and not uh, the nonlinear control, which is the sequence of the nonlinear end of the plot? And nonlinear control, which is the what? Sorry, the you take pi control, yeah. right? Because it's for linear systems. No, it's not linear. This is this this part is nonlinear. Yeah, understand. But this is the question: Why do you take linear control for nonlinear? Because you are rejecting a constant disturbance, and the internal model of of a constant disturbance is an integrator. So, necessary sufficient condition to reject the disturbance is that the controller should have the internal model. And that's a Bernsi Sidori result. Okay, so in this case you can control only in uh, the Con area of small variations. No, no, it's global. It's global, but constant disturbances. Constant. So to, it, it, think of linear systems. If you want to reject a constant disturbance, you put an integrator. Yeah. And that's enough. This is more complicated because it's a nonlinear system. And the, it's it, like the control is nonlinear since it has the gradient of V. Yeah, okay, nonlinear in, in, in the coordinates, yes, yes. Yes, it's, it's nonlinear, yeah, yes. The equation was uh, actually 
the capital is non linear, but the yes. question was why it is linear. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. No you're right, control. you're right, you're right. It's a non linear control with respect to coordinates. I, I'm talking about linear because it's like a PI like, because I this is a non linear function. Yes, sorry, yeah, good so observation. It's a combination of linear and non linear yes. control, right? Yes, it has a PI structure, but the output is a, is a non linear function. This is a non linear function of the state. Look at the it's more clear now. Okay, and th thanks for the observation. Um, where is the expression for a capital H of S of Z? It's here. It was in the previous step. This is H, sorry. This is, this is a, the classical energy function. This is the interesting trick that this is not a change of this is not the the transformation of the energy function via the change of coordinates. It's just a replacement. So you take h of q and p, and then you write it in terms exactly the same. You write it in terms of z one, z two, and z three. So this many people, which are uh, a, a little bit uh, pontillist, they say in French, they don't like that because this is this is not really. A nonlinear composition of, of the nonlinear function with respect to the change of coordinates. Because the change of coordinates is again nonlinear. You see this change of coordinates here. There's the okay, in this case, in the case of a constant name is linear. I'm moving from the coordinates Q P to Z2. Actually Z2 is changing. So this is the new coordinate. Okay? Um, uh, coefficients K I and K D you choose? You choose them, you choose them, yeah, you choose them. Any positive definite matrix, you're going to do the job. Any positive. That's what's nice about PI, that's what people like. You see, the diff why PI is, is not universal? It could be universal if someone could tell you how to tune the gains. It is positive coefficients. Positive definite matrices, yes. Yes. But what's magic about the PI, PID, what they call PID PVC, is that you obviate, you forget this tuning part. You put any KIKP, possible definite. And then the trick is which one gives good performance, but that's another story. Yes, you had a question? Okay. okay. Now, uh, this is the, what the simplest scenario, M constant and D constant. How about M non-constant? Okay. Well, if M is non-constant, then we have to do a change of coordinates. We have to do something that we reported in 2010, which is a factorization of the inverse of the inertia matrix, like a Cholesky factorization, like this, where these are full rank matrices, and then a change of coordinates from P to what we call bar P, P bar, sorry. And you can show that with this change of coordinates, the dynamics now becomes this, okay? But what we, it's still Hamiltonian, T minus T, J2 is Q symmetric, but now the Hamiltonian function has an identity matrix. Okay, so the, the, what before was an M standing there, now it's identity. So we, in some sense we come back to the previous scenario of constant M. But now we have to work on these coordinates, okay, on these coordinates. This is a well-known result from, from mm, differential geometry, and any, most book in mechanics, they can, they can show that if you take a factorization of this matrix, it's the same, if you take a factorization of M or M minus 1, it's the same. Then you, then you transform your dynamics into this form. Now, the, the, comp the complexity here is that this change of coordinates T also affects the disturbance, you see? Uh, sorry, I forgot to say that we are now under the case of only match disturbances, so D1 is equal to 3. D1, D1 is the um, uh, noise? D, D1 and D2, noise. yes, are the noises. Noise. Yeah, so this is uh, U plus, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in, in Lagrangian. Uh, <laughs> Lagrangian is a bit more complicated. But in Hamiltonian is uh, X dot equal zero i minus i minus kp nabla h plus d1 d2 plus uh, zero u so th these are so uh, we, we talk about this as unmatched because they are not in the image of this and these are matched so this the case without unmatched which is the one here it's easier 
We still have the solution for the other one, but it's complicated. It takes half a slide to show it. So if d1 is equal to zero, first step is do this change of coordinates. And I, li I draw your attention to this because in the next uh, extension, we're also going to use this change of coordinates. Actually, it has been instrumental for many, many uh, results, not just ours, but many people. So you can put d2 is constant, right? Because you thought the disturbance is constant. Uh, no, no, not yet. If it's constant, we're going to get a stronger result. If it's not constant, we're going to get just an input state stability result. D2 is not constant. D1 is zero, but D2 is not yet constant. Okay. 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 So this is the result. Well, you see that the controller got more complicated. But it's still a PI. You, you take this signal, now it's a new signal. Before it was only nabla B. Now you need all these guys, okay? The P bar, uh, the T, and you take the signal and you integrate it. Okay, so that's like the input to your PI. And then you multiply it by gain, and you multiply by gain the P bar nabla B. So it's a PI with respect to this signal here. Okay, but notice that I am plugging here this J2, which is the 2 2 block of the J matrix. Oh, sorry. So when you do this change of coordinates, this matrix appears here. And this matrix, of course, is a mess. It's the, the difference between the, the lead derivatives of these guys. Okay? So it's a, a, a complicated object. But the point is, if you apply this control, which is a PI-like, uh, the closed-loop dynamics is again port Hamiltonian. Okay, that, that, that's our main uh, objective with this. And now with energy function, which is like this. So you see, I still keep, this is the key object for me, because this is the one that is giving me the minimum of the Lyapunov function. This is the one that uh, ensures that, I don't change the Z1, Z1 is, is still Q. See, so the first coordinate remains the same. So the minimum of this guy is at Q star. And then the other ones will have a minimum at zero. Okay? And then you prove, and this is coming back to your question, uh, if the disturbance is not constant but bounded, a simply bounded function, then we have input state stability. If it's constant, we manage to reject the disturbance. So this equilibrium, which is my desired equilibrium, is global asymptotically stable. Okay. I d didn't put the, the other cases. We have all the cases treated with similar results, but the controller becomes more and more and more complicated. Okay. Uh, tell me, please, uh, P bar in um, steady state is zero. Yes, of course, because T bar, P bar is T times P. T is a full rank matrix, and this is M times Q dot. So in steady state, P bar should be zero for a constant position. Yeah. So remember, we are in the scenario of regulation. Regulation to a constant equilibrium, not tracking. Later on, we're going to talk a little bit about tracking. Okay, that's the simplest task. Okay. And I refer to you to these papers. Uh, actually, there's one that I didn't quote here that is going to appear uh, in automatic, I think, also, that extends this a little bit more. This is some joint work with, uh, with um, Rick Middleton from Australia. OK, so that was the first. I don't know if there are any questions concerning the first point. We just was rejection or attenuation of disturbances. Yeah. So we move to the second one. We had before, in the previous paper, a globally, asymptotically, actually exponentially stable speed observer. It was a paper with Alessandro Astolfi in transactions. So we managed to construct, for a general mechanical system, an observer of velocity which is globally exponentially stable. Okay? The question was, can we robustify that? With respect to two things, disturbances and uncertainty in this matrix. This matrix here, if I add it here, it will be your friction terms. Okay, so this, this represents uh, friction. So this matrix here are 
that we're going to assume to be constant and diagonal, which is physically it's a reasonable assumption for, for the simplest model of friction, just Coulomb friction. Okay? And the point is, you don't want to assume that you know this. You do not know D either, but you have to reject it, and you still want to design a speed observer. From measurement of positions, you want to reconstruct velocities. So this is the task. Remember that P is M times Q dot. So reconstructing P is the same as reconstructing velocity. Okay? Design a globally convergent robust adaptive observer for the momenta. Okay? That's, that's the task. And of course, this is a very difficult task. It's a very, if you think uh, from the point of view of observer theory, uh, an adaptive observer theory, there are no results, absolutely no results, in the case where the unknown state is multiplied by unknown parameters. So if you have a, a dynamical system with some state x, and let me split it into x1 and y. So this is measurable, this is not measurable. And then in y, you have somehow products of x1 and some parameters. So, and these parameters are unknown. You think I can get another pen and, or... Can you read this? Yeah? So these, these are constant parameters which are unknown. And x1 is unknown, only y is measurable. So in your measurements, you have products of unknown states and unknown parameters. That's an open question, a completely open question. Actually, the only result I know is this one, for this very particular case. Okay. Global, global. You can do local things, but not global. Okay? So that's a, a topic of a couple of PhDs, <laughs> PhD thesis. Design observers, adaptive observers, where the unknown states are multiplied by unknown parameters. And this is the case, because you have the, this R, multiplying q dot, or you see it here more clearly. You want to reconstruct this state, which is unknown, and you don't know r. So you have exactly this situation. Okay. Well, it turns out <coughs> that you can solve a very particular case. I should say <coughs> modestly <laughs> that it's a very particular case. It's a case that, that is known zero Riemannian uh, symbols. So. The, there exists, remember there was this factor, so we have this matrix M minus 1 of Q is equal to T of Q times T transpose of Q, and this is full rank. So you need to factor your matrix M, or the inverse, like this. For instance, you can do Cholesky factorization, but not necessarily. Actually, we proved that Cholesky is not always the best choice. But this factorization always exists, okay? And now the assumption is that the columns of this uh, matrix satisfy this integrability condition. This is the Lie bracket between the columns. So it's, it's, uh, it's a strong assumption, which is equivalent to, there's an object which is called the, Riemannian sim the Riemann symbols of M, which is something uh, uh, intrinsic independently or independent of coordinates. So if and, if and only if this is true, these Riemann symbols are zero. And it's why they, co they call it the zero curvature systems. So it's a, the easy to control systems in some words. And this equivalent to existence of a map in Q such that this matrix is a gradient. The columns of this matrix are gradient uh, vector fields. Okay. So these three things are equivalent. We're not going to use them, it's just to say that this is a restrictive assumption. It's a class, a very particular class. Of course, it contains constant M, but uh, that's not the point, okay? A second assumption is that the rows of the factor T, where there are friction terms, are independent of Q. So we cannot, we cannot assume that all of them, all these elements are, are unknown. Only those where you, you have some particular property related to T. Okay? But that, that doesn't rule out the scenario where there are products between unknown velocities and unknown uh, friction. 
coefficients. So there are. This assumption does not imply that this phenomenon is not happening. This is not true. Okay. So it's a particularly benign situation of this uh, complicated situation. And there, there are physical examples. Of course, the question, you can put whatever assumption you want. But later, you have to prove that there are physical systems which satisfy these assumptions. And there are at least three or four. I think I have two. This so-called 2D spider crane which is a, actually a, controlling this object is a very active topic because of all this uh, uh, um, uh, well, how are they call this these big uh, containers and the containers are now being moved with this kind of cranes these cranes are dominating the the market so all of the all of the standard cranes that they, they had in Rotterdam and I guess in Rostov I don't know where in Russia you have big ports uh, now, now they've been, I, I've been replaced by gantry cranes. So cranes like this where you have a cable, flexible cable, and then this guy is hanging, and then the pendulum is... This is a difficult object to control. Well, this guy verifies the assumption. Okay. And another guy that verifies the assumption, it's a, a redundant manipulator, so you have more uh, controllers than degrees of freedom. Uh, with one elastic degree of freedom. I mean, this is an object that also has been studied in the robotics literature for many years. Okay? So at least to show you that there are some physical objects of practical interest that satisfy the assumptions. Okay? And this is the main result. I'm sorry it's really very, very technical. Uh, but I'm going to give you just the main message. So let R be the friction coefficients, okay? And you divide the friction coefficients in those which are unknown and those which are known, according to assumption two. So you define this matrix C, which contains only zeros and ones, and uh, to split, remember R is a vector, so you, there are some that you don't know and some that you know. So this matrix C classifies these this Rs. Then this is the adaptive momenta observer. It's based on, on a theory uh, that we developed together with Alessandro Astolfi, which is called Immersion and Invariance. So we have a book on Immersion and Invariance, and it's a procedure, it's a technique to design observers, to design stabilizer controllers, and to design adaptive controllers based on the idea of immersion, immersion of a dynamics into a lower dimensional manifold. That's I and I, okay? That's just the technique that is used. So you see, okay, I'm not going to enter in details. There is an estimator for R, so you have to estimate the resistor that you don't know. There is an estimator for D, which is D, D hat. D hat and R hat are your estimates, so it's adaptive in the sense that you need to estimate these guys. And then there is a reconstruction of P, which is called P hat. Remember, you need to estimate P. You are trying to, to reconstruct momenta. So this is P hat in bold face. And uh, well, Q is uh, the given in the lemma. Then there are just matrices that you need to define. These are nonlinear gains, OK? Because they depend on Q. And then the property is that, well, you achieve your objective. For all initial conditions, you get P hat converging to P. Okay. We don't get parameter convergence. We, don't, we cannot prove that R hat U converges to R U or D hat converges to D unless we have persistence of excitation. This is well known in adaptive control. Okay. But you, you have your ideal reconstruction of velocity. Yeah? In this case, Q is measurable. Yes, yes, yes. P? No. No. P is the moment. Yes. What physical sense of uh, Q? Physical. Q are the generalist coordinates. Yes. Q are the positions. Remember that P, I, I know that this creates some confusion. P is just M of Q times Q dot. This is the so called momenta. Okay? So if you reconstruct P, since you know Q, you reconstruct Q dot. Okay? So, 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 <coughs> so on this slide, uh, there is only observer, not control log. Only observer, only observer. Okay. 
Non-linear server, yes. adaptive one. Uh, adaptive one, yeah. Okay. And the next task is, can we use this in control? <laughs> and it's, uh, I had a PhD student who gave up and almost committed suicide. <laughs> it's a very difficult task, particularly because of the adaptive part. Without adaptation, we have that result. If we, if we know all the friction coefficients, then we have another paper which is precisely global asymptotic stability via measurement only of positions. But if you add the adaptation, it's two things. The, the friction coefficient and the disturbance. You have two additional complexities. Okay. Did you test this observer in some practice? Not, not this observer, what we tried, well not ourselves, this guy from Naples, Bruno Siciliano, he tried uh, the, the known, known friction and known uh, without disturbances. Yeah, okay. He tried that. Actually, he added the, the previous uh, part of the talks, we're adding this integrator. He, he did, the, but just experimentally, we don't have the theoretical proof. So he added to the observer, not the adaptive one, but the known parameter observer, he added the integral action and it worked in experiments, but okay. Actually in this disk, disk on disk system. And he also tried it in a, in a mobile robot. In some, some mobile robot. I, I'm not involved in that research, but I know he tried it. Okay. It's a very active group in robotics. There's another person which is working on this, which is Stefano Stramigioli from Twente. He has tried this also experimentally in drones. Okay. Actually, Stefano, you probably know, he's a part of the laboratory of Botsov uh, in, in Itmo. So he's coming every year to, to St. Petersburg. Okay, sorry, the second, the last. I'm running out of time, huh? Okay, as much as you like. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to have you sleeping here. It's PID, okay? PID. As I said, this is the topic which is very close to my heart. I, I'm, now we are having two regular papers published on this topic, one in transactions, one in automatica, only on PIDs. PIDs for general nonlinear systems and PIDs for mechanical systems. And we're thinking of writing a book. We may decide to write a book. Because we have a lot of results, and then there are other people working on, in other areas in power systems. They are using PIDs a lot of. Okay, again the same the same scenario, but now uh, under actuated. Now there is no identity matrix here, but there is a, a G matrix here. Okay, if it's fully actuated, the PID works without any problem. The, the difficulty is when you have uh, this is the slot in a Lee controller. If you are familiar with this controller. Is basically a PID in different coordinates. But if you have under actuation, then the problem gets a little bit more complicated. And of course, you need to. It's not a full rank matrix. Okay? Sorry, Sorry it's a full rank matrix, but M strict is more than N. What from did you take this kind of function? From what. Uh, uh this is the energy of the system. This is the, this is the total energy. Kinetic energy plus potential energy. Okay. It's just the model of the mechanical system. There's no control. This is before control. Eh? Before control. Now we're going to design the control. So it's not like in the previous scenario. I know a little bit confusing. When I said that we already added one control and then we're going to add second control. This is without first control. Just pure PID. No nonlinear control. Well, it's going to be a nonlinear PID, but it has the structure of a PID. Okay. And now the problem is you would like to change this energy function into this energy function, which is going to be your Lyapunov function. Where now you want this, you want, you want to preserve the mechanical structure. So you would like the system after control to still be a mechanical system, in the sense that you can write it in this form with a suitable energy function. Okay? So this is what we call in passivity based control energy shaping. So you change the energy of the system, of the open loop system, to this form in closed loop. And what you want, you still want this matrix to be positive definite because you want it to be a, a metric, an inertia matrix. But now you want that this new function, this new potential energy, has the minimum where you want. Again, need not be convex, just uh, an isolated minimum. Okay. And the objective is how can I assign a function like this with a PID, we know how to do it if we have full state measurements and it's any general nonlinear control. 
we have a class of systems for which you can do it. But now the question is, when can I do it with just API key? Okay? And a bunch of assumptions are going to appear, of course. Okay. And this is uh, the class of systems for which we know how to do it. Okay? Sure. First, we partition the state into actuated and unactuated coordinates according to this ordering. So th these coordinates, these G coordinates, there are some which are actuated, appear in the image of G, and some which do not. Okay? So you partition, it's clearer here, okay? If you put the G here, so instead of an I, 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 I can always buy a change of coordinates split it into this, the G. So some of them are unactuated and some of them are actuated. Okay? So why a change of coordinates? The G can always be, okay, not always. There is some integrability condition, but almost always transform into that. Okay? So then you split the Q into activated and actuated, and you split the M into blocks for actuated, actuated and actuated, and so on, with the suitable dimensions. Okay? So this actuated part has the same dimension as the control vector, m, and the other one is n minus m. Now, you need, you need precisely the possibility of transforming the g into this form, and this is a necessary and sufficient condition for a matrix g to be transformable by a change of coordinates to this form. Okay? It, it, you need that the columns of g are involutive. Okay, and so or more precisely, they span an involutive distribution. You have to go and, and compute the, the Lie brackets. Okay? Now, this is one key assumption, uh, and it's uh, the weak part of the result, that the inertia matrix depends only on the unactuated coordinates. It, it does not depend on the actuated ones. These are very technical assumptions. It's just, I cannot give any physical justification is what we need in order to apply the technique, which is, of course, not very pleasant. Okay. The third, the second assumption, well, third, if we can this, is that this block is constant, and the third is, well, increasingly we relax this, but okay, let me talk about this, uh, that the, the potential energy is, is a separable function. I split it into two, a function only of QA and a function of Q. We, we can do better now. Okay. Okay. Under these assumptions, I'm going to be able to solve the problem. Okay. Remember, the problem is when can I design a PID that will transform this system with this energy function into a mechanical system with this energy function? That's the problem. So I'm, I'm assigning a Lyapunov a function of a particular form. Okay. Okay, and this is based on, on passivity, of course. Uh, we call it PID PVC because PID passivity based control. So the trick here is to identify the good passive outputs. So we know that velocity is a passive output, but velocity is not good. So we need to identify some others. And we identify these two outputs, YU and YA, and prove that they are passive outputs. So in the sense that there is something called the starch function, so that H A dot, okay, sorry, first you do an inner loop, you cancel the actuated part of the potential energy, which you can always do because this is, this is the actuated part, it's in the image of G, and prove that these two mappings are passive mappings. Now, at the beginning we thought that we could just add them up, yeah, it, but you need to add them up in a suitable way. So you need to do a linear combination of this output with some suitable coefficients, okay? In order to define the output to which you're going to apply, you're going to apply the, the, the PID. Let me skip this part, uh, just to point out that these assumptions seem very restrictive, but they are, they are true for all these examples. The card, the card pendulum, the pendulbot, a spherical pendulum on the puck, the disc on disc, robots with flexible joints. So all these systems verify the assumptions. So they look restrictive, but they are applicable to some benchmark examples. Okay. And that's uh, our motivation to pursue. 
Okay. Uh, let me not skip the details. Uh, okay, I, I just need one additional assumption, which is an assumption of the block uh, 2, 1 or 1, 2 of the M matrix. And this has to be, again, again, it's an integrability assumption. Why we need integrability assumptions? Because we're going to apply PID controllers, so we're going to integrate some signals. And we want these signals to be expressible as vector, uh, to be vector fields which are gradient vector fields. So you take this a function h of x, and this is your y. If this h of x is a gradient vector field, or the columns are gradient vector fields, then when you integrate, which is you're going to apply an integrator, you're going to create an invariant manifold. This is the, tri the key trick. And then the dynamics on this invariant manifold is going to have a, a better property. That's why these, all these integrability conditions appear. Okay? Because you want, you, want, you want to create invariant manifolds. Okay? You want to, not just the foliations that naturally exist, but you want to create new ones where you want to project your dynamics. Okay? So then uh, it's expressed here. If this is true, equivalently, there exists a function b whose derivative is equal to this. Okay? So this is this, this is, these two things are equivalent. And this V is going to be an element of my, uh, that's why we're calling it Vn, is going to be an, an element that I'm going to add to my potential energy. Okay? These are requirements that I need to create my Laponov function. What is, sorry, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, here, the world of Azetmius, exactly, because I don't understand, for linear system <laughs> is clear, but here. Okay, okay, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I skipped this. If you if you put a PID, if you put a PID, this appears even in linear systems. Huh? You have a system x dot equals f x plus g of x u, and y equal h of x plus j of x u, or even without this. And then you do a dynamic extension, z dot equal y, so your integral part, and then you do u equal minus ki z minus kp y minus kd, because you want pid. You want also the derivative part. Okay? Kd uh, y dot. Okay? So when you, when you do, okay, even without this, if you have a relative degree zero system, you have a j here, sorry, if you have a j here, you, you here have a problem of, of realizability because this y is h plus j u. So you have u on both sides. Okay? So you need to be sure that this algebraic equation is, is solvable. And this is precisely this well posedness condition. So you need i minus plus kpj. This is a matrix. u equal minus kiz minus kph. This is equivalent to this. Okay? And this has to be a full rank matrix. Otherwise you cannot solve this guy. So this is the, the well posedness condition. Okay, you so it was again the nonlinear system with this uh, linear assumption, right? With this, I, I want to close the loop of this system. Okay. Even in linear appears in A, B, C, D. When you get this D here, there's going to be a D, a KPD multiplying here. So I plus KPD has to be full rank. Otherwise, you cannot solve it. Okay, okay. okay so you need that the determinant of this matrix is different from zero. Because now you have to invert the matrix. Yeah, yeah. The same thing in linear, A, B, C, D. Okay? This is for relative degree zero. Now, for relative degree non-zero, this problem does not appear. But it appears if you want to have a differentiator, if you want a D term. There's a y dot, and the y dot brings u. So this is the assumption. Uh, actually, we thought that it was a technical assumption not important, but it, 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 when we started doing simulations and some experiments, we realized it was critical, because all these things are local anyway. I mean, this, we, we claim glo globality, but when you go to, to, real, to experiments, it's a, everything is local. So locally, the, the region where th this determinant was different from is very small. So it, it's, it's a critical assumption. We have to be careful. And it does not, it's not solved with a suitable choice of Kp. 
I mean, it, it helps to, to choose a suitable KP, but it's actually determined by, by the function J. Okay? Okay, sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, uh, I am on assumption A5, <laughs> sorry, that this matrix should be full rank. And now this, the one, one before the last assumption, you need, okay, sorry, this is not very well organized. I'm going to apply this controller, okay? I'm going to create a new output that I call YD which is a linear combination of the two signals that I identified before, YA, YU, multiplied by some gains, and I'm going to apply my PI to this. So I take proportional times YD, and then integral times KI in times the integral of YD. This, this object here is the integral of YD. Sorry, the zero shouldn't be here. And then the derivative part. So this is the PID, proportional integral derivative with respect to this output. Now these gains, they have to be chosen treatably. They cannot be an arbitrary positive definite matrix, but it has to satisfy this condition. So you see the KP, the KD, the KA, KU, the, this matrix should be positive definite, and this function should have a minimum at Q star. So there are some tunings of the gains, for you, for it will work, and some others. If you don't satisfy this, there's no guarantee. So okay. you apply nonlinear PID controller, right? It's again a nonlinear PID controller, but not now the gains cannot be arbitrary. The gains, the KPK, KD, they have to be chosen such that this condition holds. Okay, that's that's the trick. Okay. Okay, so that's the result. So if, you do, if, if all these assumptions are true, then the desired equilibrium is a globally stable equilibrium with this Lyapunov function, the one that you wanted from the very beginning. Okay, okay so uh, there's an, a, well, the proof, I'm gonna skip it. There's an extension to tracking uh, some constant speed trajectories. So this was stabilization only, but you can extend it to, to a particular case of tracking, only constant speed trajectories. But let me skip that, okay? And let me show you uh, an animation. Uh, oh shit, uh, but it should be here. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry, it doesn't show up. <coughs> well, we had an animation, I'm sorry, it's not showing up. We did uh, this work also for, for a flexible pendulum, a very flexible pendulum. And uh, we applied this PID, and you see that the, even though, th if you don't have any control, the pendulum will fall. It's so flexible, they will fall. But with this control, it manages to st stabilize the cart and put a very flexible pendulum in this position. That's, but this, uh, the analysis is, is tricky because now you're talking about a partial differential equations. We're modeling this by a Timoshenko beam and the analysis is not the same that I had before. Uh, on the other hand, for the Carton pendulum, this, now this is the Carton pendulum uh, in, a, in, a, in an inclined slope. Okay, so you start here, okay, and then you want to move this down and I place the cart in this position and the pendulum still here. So this, this is the, 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 the motion, you see it, it moves down and eventually reaches the desired point with zero uh, angle. Okay, so you, you bring up the, the, you keep up the pendulum in the upside and you manage to move the cart down. Okay, so this is an example that satisfies all the assumptions. Okay, and we could do it with a PID. I don't understand why this is not showing. Sorry. 
I'm sorry, but uh, there's another movie of the flexible, which is very impressive because you see the, the pendulum falling down and it lifts the pendulum. Okay, okay so that's it. <laughs> no conclusions, but okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, questions, please. I can just make a comment about what we are currently doing. But one first question is, can we close the loop with these observers, for instance? That's an open question. A, qu a question that is attracting a lot of our attention is tracking. All these results are for regulation, but many applications, all these mobile robots, drones, helicopters, and so on, they are really interested in tracking. So what we're doing, and I think that's quite exciting, it's uh, <laughs> Basically, what we do, we change the energy function to put it in a form like this, where this is Q star. Okay, so this is the B of Q, and then we we know that this function is uh, has a minimum where we want, or it's gonna go down to this position. So now instead of doing this, we're pushing this guy up and mixing, making a Mexican sombrero. You have seen a lot of Mexican sombreros now on the streets. So we're, going to, we're doing something like this. Okay. What is the objective is that now, the minimum is, is an orbit. Okay. So it's a periodic orbit, and we're generating periodic orbits via the deformation of the energy function. And then if we push a little bit further up, you get another periodic orbit and so on. And now we're working on stabilization of periodic orbits as a first step to go to tracking. So the, before tracking of general signals, first, can we track periodic orbits? And the answer is yes, with this idea. Okay? We're doing this. Actually, Fratkov had something like this uh, many years ago, uh, but not for tracking, for chaos generation or something more complicated than I don't understand. Uh, but we want to do it for tra that's what we're doing now. So instead of assigning convex functions or functions with isolated minimum, we're assigning Mexican somewhere. And we call this technique the Mexican somewhere assignment. <laughs> so that, that's one thing we're doing. And it turns out to be very useful for power systems, for instance, for power converters, DC to AC power converters. You want to assign that because you want to create a periodic orbit. And also walking robots. With Mark Spong, we're doing some work on working robots, which is the same problem. You want to create a gate, and that's a periodic orbit. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much again. Uh, I don't know, and, uh, about disturbances. Mm, what are examples when you have D constant? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> not too many. <laughs> No, well, there are, there are, uh, because this, these disturbances... Parameter, which can be identified and so on, but... No, but this, this, is, this is like the mean, like the mean of, of, of a non-zero variance noise. So this D bar, this D is, is the, you, there, there's noise, high frequency noise, but it has a mean. Yeah. And you're estimating the mean. Mm -hmm. You're rejecting the mean. That's, that's the way to think about this. Of course, the disturbance is something, but it has a mean, and you want to bring down the mean. That's the uh, explanation. And that is particularly true in motors, for instance. In motors. Okay. So you me measure, because the motors are fed by inverters, which are uh, controlled by uh, some modulate modulation procedures, some PWM, and they bring a lot of noise. So this, the noise is there all the time, but you want to, to, lo to eliminate the, the mean. With the noise, so it's, it stays at zero. So that's it. And this always happens because the le the legs of the inverter are not are not balanced. There's one leg that goes faster than the other. Some AGBTs which are defectors and so. On. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Uh, do you estimate disturbances like uh, states, or only you estimate by? Your yeah. <coughs> only states. Do you that, yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, with uh, Alexei Alex Bobsov, we're working on that because they have been working a lot on, on Saint Petersburg. Right? Saint Petersburg, yeah, Saint Petersburg. They, they have worked a lot on estimation of periodic sinusoidal disturbances for echo canceling for many applications. 
So one, the simplest example is assume that the disturbance has an internal model. So if it has an internal model, for instance, a sinusoid, you model as a doubly integrated with J omega axis poles, and then you have to put this model into the control. That, that's a topic of, of interest. We're, with uh, this group, we're working on that. So extending this result not for constant or arbitrary disturbance, but disturbances that admit an internal model, for instance, sinusoids. And it should be, it should be straightforward, I think. We, but, we, but, but, sorry, but in, in this work, what, which you showed now, you rejected disturbances without estimation of that, right? There are two things. One, which was the first part, which was just rejecting without estimating, just adding an integrator. And the second was is estimating the disturbance. The second one, which is in order to reconstruct the velocity, we needed to estimate the disturbance and the resistance. This is, this is uh, adaptive in the sense of estimation of disturbances. But actually, the first one also you estimate disturbances because the equilibrium to which the state of the integrator is going to converge is precisely D. D. So you are, <laughs> you are estimating D. But you are not interested because you, all you want is to go to the side position. But you are estimating the, the disturbance if it's constant. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. because the equilibrium of the integrator is precisely the D that you need to reject. But we don't care about that. I actually also have one question to the observer part. Um, maybe I misunderstood something. You mentioned the clone friction in your model. Yeah. Right, but actually you wrote uh, just viscous friction, not the dry friction. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, the dry friction, it also could be interpreted as a sort of velocity function, but something special, the signal function. So it looks like that uh, your results, they don't work for uh, dry friction. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a good point also. But dry friction is the biggest problem. I mean. Actually, it would be something like this, okay? Mm -hmm. Like the Strebeck model or something like that. Or the simplest case is just like this. We're, we're assuming this, eh? indeed. We're neglecting this part. We don't know. We don't know how to estimate this thing. It's an open. Because you can assume some model that there's something called the Lugre model yeah. from the group of Grenoble, which is a continuous function. But I don't believe in that model. Uh, actually, we have a paper with Nikita Barabanov where we prove that the Lugre model is not a passive operator. So it cannot model uh, friction if it's not if it's not dissipative, you see. I mean, if you try to move something real, like a real robot, I encountered with that problem. Uh, viscous friction is not so big problem. The biggest problem is dry friction, because you, ju you can just, you, you don't know the result. You can, you don't know what happens. With yeah, I understand, yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right. Yeah, friction is a very tricky phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing we know how to do, because of linearity. Because this is already a nonlinear phenomenon. Maybe it's not the right to <coughs> the cooling friction, just with the friction. friction. Cooling friction is sort of dry friction model. Yeah, this yeah, one. Yes, 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 yes. We have actually have stiction, you have this constant part. That we don't know how to do it. Thanks. We know we have an old paper uh, with Elena Pantele on uh, r compensation of friction. But you, you have a mechanical system. Dry friction. And both. 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 So you model this as some sector-bounded nonlinearity, and then and then you apply some something like hyperstability or well, hyperstability for the Romanians for you, uh, absolute stability theory, and we, we managed to prove some rejection. But when it was it, published, which year? It, I I don't recommend that paper because ah. it, like, theoretically it's correct. Ah. This is uh, the Russian school of doing things very rigorously. So Lena did a beautiful proof. But then people at the, K, at the ETH in Zurich, there was a PhD student of, uh, uh, well, someone from ETH, and he tried experimentally, actually he invited me, I went there, we tried to make it work, it never worked. So, okay, it theoretically, <laughs> it's the systems system some control letters from 98 or something like that, but it's, it doesn't work. There are many theoretical results that don't work, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> Yes. Are you main result? Victory, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna win also against Sweden and uh, and uh, what is the next uh, Korea? So the Mexicans somewhere is gonna be on your streets. <laughs> we will meet Russia in the semifinals. Uh, if everything goes well, we will meet in the semifinals. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I was so afraid that I would lose you. <laughs>